All right, we're on. Um, ben. G'day, Casey. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm so excited to have you um, join me today. You're one of my absolute favorite, uh, favorite, favorite people. Ben and I um, met, I think it's been like six years, six, seven years yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, and spend a lot of time swimming together when I'm in Australia. <laughs> yes, sopping wet queers is the sopping name of our group, queers. informally, informally. Um, and uh, so I'm super excited to have you. And uh, so I'm going to introduce you to our listeners. And then the typical format is that we kind of let everyone know what kind of the overarching framework that we're going to travel and then we just kind of go in so um perfect i can't wait it's uh it is my absolute pleasure to introduce everyone to my dear friend but also brilliant author and journalist benjamin law um thank you <laughs> Tell me, tell, tell me more, Casey. Tell me more. No, uh, I'm just kidding. Ben wrote <laughs> this amazing memoir called The Family Law uh, and has uh, written a beautiful play that premiered at the Melbourne Theatre Company, Torch the Place. Um, but also uh, the memoir, The Family Law, became a three season television show. And in 2016, The Family Law was the first ever show with an Asian Australian family as leads. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about. Ben, you're also doing your PhD in the representation of minorities in television and film. Um, so yeah, actually, I've done it. Like that, that is a part of my life where I'm like, that's done. I pack it away. People often ask, like, why don't you use the, the title doctor? And I'm like, why? So I can remember that I did a PhD over and over again. I, would, I don't want to relive that trauma. So can I can but, remember but, that trauma? <laughs> 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 but but I but it is something that's informed my work ever since looking at representation in Australian media and the arts because I can't divorce myself from that conversation yeah well I am really looking forward to kind of really getting in there because I I too really identify with um with that mm. notion that our bodies actually can't divorce themselves from this conversation of representation and visibility um yeah so the arc that we're going to travel is a lot of folks who are listening are from uh, Europe and the United States and maybe some Australians. Uh-huh. You've got a fan base in Australia. Australia, the Australia knows you, Casey. <laughs> um, we're going to just give a general overview of Australian history, uh, particularly around um, the systemic racism that is at one of its one of its foundations. Um, mm -hmm. So I thought, Ben, I was wondering if you could give us just kind of like a general, just a general launch in. I have some notes here so I can jump in if you're missing dates or whatever. But um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But but um, maybe you well, could get us started. Well, when we talk about Australian history, everyone wants to start at 1788, when this continent was first colonised by white people, right? But that's not where we should begin at all. And in fact, a lot of Australians are starting to wake up to the fact that this continent um, is the home of the oldest continuing human civilization ever. Um, Aboriginal Australia dates back at least 65,000 years in the carbon record, which shows that it's the earliest evidence of human civilization and culture. And when, um, you know, Australians or non-Australians think about Aboriginal Australians, they think of hunter-gatherers, but these people are astronomers. These are the people who harvested grain to bake the first documented bread in the world. I mean, there's so much documentation about how we've come out of Africa, but there are a lot of people within the science and um, anthropological world that are actually starting to realize there was something unique going on in Australia that, um, that hasn't really been examined closely. So if you read a book like um, Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu, which has been a bestseller in Australia for the last few years, because there's been this hunger, this absence of knowledge, you will discover that, you know, these people, um, you know, they were building houses, they were building structures, they weren't hunter gatherers, they formed communities. And nowadays, when you look at 
the map of Australia according to our First Nations, according to Aboriginal nations, you'll see this like continent is a mosaic of languages, of, of peoples, of nations. And so when Australia in 2020 likes to pat ourselves on the back and say, we're a multicultural nation, we're a, we're a nation of diverse languages. I mean, that's true to an extent. And we think about that within the paradigm of migration and that kind of post-colonial history, but it's always been true. I mean, I'm not indigenous myself. This has been an education for me yeah. after leaving school, you know, where there's a vacuum of conversation about Aboriginal Australia. Um, so that that's probably the place where we should all start. And I know that nowadays in Australia, one thing that I've noticed has changed within a generation is when we start conversations, formal conversations, events, we try to acknowledge the Aboriginal nation on which we stand. So I'm, I'm broadcasting, I'm talking to you from modern day Sydney, which is Gadigal country, part of the Eora nation. Um, but there is this growing consciousness of that history. And then we also then want to start it at 1788, but now I've also realised that's also not when Australian history necessarily starts. One of the projects that I did last year was this um, documentary for the public broadcaster about Chinese Australian history. And, you know, Australia has an Asian Australia history that predates white settlement and British colonists. So there's also that. So when you talk about Australian history, like I could give you the textbook version that we were given in high school, but now that I think, you know, Australia is such, in some ways, we're the most ancient continent, but also a really young nation in the idea of nation states. And in that kind of modern conception of what Australia is, I think we're kind of teenagers. Yeah. You know, we're teenagers who've been given information we're still learning about who we are. We get really defensive when we called out on who we are. But I think we're getting to that through that teenage stage where we're like, actually, the idea of what Australia is is not a settled, is not a settled artifact. It's an ongoing live dialogue, debate, wrestling and, and reckoning. I'm not sure if that's the answer that you're after, but it it's kind is. of that's the lovely. answer that's in my brain at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I guess what I can say is that I'm here talking to you in Vermont on Abenaki land. Um, mm. And there's a, the, you know, the United States also has a history of genocide. Um, so, oh. the, um, and there are only a few, um, a few of them left. And that's a very recent discovery that they're connected to the Abenaki tribe. Um, mm. Some of the language has remained. So here in Vermont, there are a few of them, but there is, uh, you know, um, a, a, a dark, unreckoned history of what it meant to be indigenous here in the United States. Um, so there's another similarity that the United States and Australia share is that mm. uh, in 19, it was only in 1975 that the Racial Discrimination Act was passed. And it was, you know, 1968 that the Civil Rights Act was passed, mm. um, allowing for anyone who was Black or African American in the United States, the equal rights to anyone else. Um, mm. And the 1967, there was the referendum that all Australians were enfranchised citizens, right? So it's like everyone's been on this horrible journey around acknowledging the humanity and dignity of their fellows. Um, and then the, the, the one that's also really complicated to talk about, you know, I, I love Australia for so many reasons. Australia is mm. such a beautiful second home for me. I'm married to an Australian and I just have such deep love and affection for the country and for my friends and my fellows that I've met there. Um, but in 1901, there was something that was passed that came to be known as the white Australia policy, right? Like you talked about, there's, you know, um, uh, you know, we want to talk about 1780 as like the time, right, when settlers came to Australia. And that was the beginning of Australian history. But there were, you know, migration patterns between, you know, China and Australia. Mm -hmm. Australia is a, as a part of uh, the, you know, 
Southeast Asia. Like it is, it is integral into, in that place. And, um, and so, um, in 1901, uh, what has since come to be known as the white Australia policy, um, they created very complicated um, entrance, you know, kind of requirements for anyone who was not white, but particularly who was Chinese, forbidding them to arrive into Australia. Um, mm. and, um, and it makes me think of the fact that it wasn't until 2016 with your show, The Family Law, that is 70, you know, a hundred, that's over a hundred years later. Uh -huh. That's how long it took for Australia to, to show a beautiful story like the one that you have to show. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is, um, you know, 19, 1901 is this country, this continent called Australia, this modern founding of Australia federating as a nation. But one of the first things that's actually passed in this new federation of Australia is what you're talking about, the white Australia policy. And that also ties into what, what you were saying about where Australia is located on the map. You know, geographically, we are a part of Oceania, part of the Asia Pacific, like our closest neighbours, Papua New Guinea and Indonesia um, and yet you know there was this huge kind of anxiety that um, that we needed to be tethered to the motherland of Britain and to our you know our much more advanced cousins in the United States of America that kind of very Eurocentric Anglo-centric idea of who we were and Chinese people were already in the country by then um, our people came from southern China to be gold miners and people do know about the Chinese presence in the gold rush in Australia, but they often don't know that our presence preceded that as indentured laborers. I mean, that's a nicer word for something that comes very close to slavery, basically, yeah. um, who worked as shepherds, who worked as cane cutters, all of that. And a lot of those people came to Australia um, escaping the war out of China. And they thought, well, I'll come here earn some money and get back to China as soon as I can. They didn't want to stay in this place. You know, for them, China was the cradle of civilization. Australia was frontier country and it really was. But of course, a lot of them couldn't build up the, the revenue that was needed to, to go back home. So they stayed here and they made families. And when you go to the northern parts of Australia, like Darwin yeah. to far north Queensland, you'll see a lot of people who look like me who have Australian accents who are, that are way thicker because they've been here for four or five generations. And they just went like, when I found out that those people existed, I was like, what? It's like this, this kind of flip of Australian history where you're like, wait, what have I been told? And because, I mean, and this will bleed into conversations we'll have soon, but because I grew up in a part of Australia that was incredibly white and the media, um, shown back to me was also incredibly white. It wasn't until I left home and, and moved to the city, the big smoke of, of Brisbane, <laughs> uh, that How I actually realized. You moved realized, to first, it's Brisbane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is kind of a, a joke in Australia, right? Because Brisbane has always been considered a sleepy city. But if you grew outside of it, you're like, that's the big smoke. Um, but it wasn't until I moved there that I realized how multicultural this country is and how multicultural it's been, you know, before white arrival and, and since, because, you know, as it, as it stands now, roughly, you know, 12 to 16% of Australia's population is Asian Australian or has significant Asian ancestry. And that's roughly proportionate to how many black Americans there are in the United States, obviously very, very different histories. Um, but when I think of black representation in the U S media, which already, um, you know, has a live dialogue around it about how it needs to be better. You know, I, I think if outsiders came to Australia or, or looked at Australian media, they would just assume that most of us were still white yeah. outside of maybe cooking, cooking reality shows. Um, and that's it. So, so we've got this kind of gulf between the story that we tell ourselves and the stories that we export versus the reality of our of our cultural makeup.
Yeah. You know, I saw an ad recently. How I came up on this ad is uh, involves kind of like a weird tangent with an ad agency, but um, it was recent and it was a tourist ad for Australia and both of the actors are white, but they uh -huh. referenced Crocodile Dundee and only showed the beaches and then the Sydney Opera House. And the reason I was being asked to look at this ad that has gone out, it has happened, uh -huh. someone, you know, a very big corporation purchased it, it played, it has happened. I couldn't believe that it got past the first person i was like did you guys ask anyone it who actually lives in australia what the fuck because this is crazy. <laughs> like this is like the 1980s has called and wants like whatever version of australia this is back because it has it is not the truth right and i i really love this language that you've used around there's this gulf between the australia that we export and the australia that is actually the lived you know the, the lived experience that is um complex and engaged and messy and and beautiful and um so i guess i wonder when did you so when did you learn about history properly? Mm, that's a really interesting question. Because um, I remember you know, what I did, but I'm curious about what you... I'm, I'm curious as to uh, when, when you did first. I mean, I've got my own ideas and my own <laughs> stories, but what, what, what was your kind of education? I mean, I understood without language um, that the stories that were being told were not the truth. Um, but I think I was just generally anti-authoritarian, so held a suspicion of anything I was being taught, taught. But by sixth and seventh grade in Europe, Russia is the USSR or was, and all of these countries are dismantling. So the truth, of, mm. a, of a nation state became very um, fragmented and arbitrary in my mind, in that what we saw on a map was actually not who was in the map. Um, yes. And, you know, of course, France has this very complicated, um, you know, dark, dark history with its own racism and colonialism. Um, so I, I was aware of that without any of the language. But it wasn't until I read Howard Zinn's The People's History um, when I was 19 that I fully understood how absent actual history had been from any of the history that I had read. Mm. In this case, specifically about the United States. Um, yeah. How, yeah. How did that happen for you? Well, when I was growing up, I grew up in a part of Australia that um, the Aboriginal nation is Gubby Gubby, right? Um, and that seemed to do quite a successful job at wiping out a lot of the people. There are still Gubby Gubby people um, around nowadays, um, modern day Gubby Gubby folks, but we just did not have that sense of Aboriginal history. We didn't do what Australian schools do now, which is often a lot of them start the day or at least formal events by acknowledging country. Um, I'd never heard that before growing up, um, wow. but I do remember I had a good modern history teacher and she did tell us to draw attention to one particular massacre called the Mile Creek Massacre. And there's a huge denial of massacres in Australia, even though um, if you read Stan Grant, who's an Australian journalist and analyst, if you read his books, he'll be like, they're hiding in plain sight. Like there is a reason why you drive out in any direction in Australia and there are all these like ominously named landmarks like Murderer's Creek, Disaster Lane, you know, like horror, horror, so like just true. These, you know, there are just all of these really dark places. And he's like, if you talk to Aboriginal people of that era, that 
area, they'll tell you about the massacre. And so even just learning about the wine massacre, Mile Creek, that really switched something in my head. There's this myth that Australians have told themselves, and it was actually a governmental policy that was to, you know, essentially steal children away from their families and to what they called soften the pillow of a dying race. But this was essentially, you know, a genocidal policy that was enacted by the government right up until um, the 1960s and 70s and arguably manifests in different ways still today. Um, Yeah. And so, you know, later as an adult, when people would say, oh, there were no massacres here, like, sure, there were scuffles, there were short little scuffles, and it's like, no, well, I know of that at least one massacre. And then, of course, you get older and it's like, that massacre did not stand alone. This is how this country became Australia. It was through massacre. And now there is a broader language for that. Um, we refer to them as the frontier wars. You know, that is, that's the black language around what actually happened. They were actual wars. And, um, you know, to be honest, I think a lot of my education happened when I started engaging meaningfully with Aboriginal Australians, that sounds awful because um, it's like, how did you not prior? You know, it's like, how did you not grow up with Aboriginal friends? Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians are roughly 3% of the population, which means that it's actually very easy for non-Indigenous Australians to have grown up without any meaningful contact. And research has been done that shows that the majority of non-Indigenous Australians, even now, still have not had meaningful contact, like face-to-face contact with an Aboriginal Australian. I'm lucky enough that, you know, I live in the middle of Sydney. Yep. I work in the media. I work in the arts. Um, There is better, but not robust, but there is much better representation of First Nations people in those fields and I feel like I have those people in my life and therefore um, the conversations I've had with them, uh, the books that I've then read, the people I follow online, that's been a much bigger kind of education. Um, but, you know, when I talk about that book, Dark Emu, and learning about Aboriginal architecture, engineering and science, which are kind of bodies of work that are not synonymous with Aboriginal right. Australia, that, that only really happened in my 30s. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think Australia, maybe I reflect a lot of non-Indigenous Australians where I'm like, my education is coming way too late. And it's still ongoing, of course. Mm, mm. I mean, I think that that's very similar here. You know, I grew up in a white supremacist household, expats from... France, like my parents literally left once the Civil Rights Act passed here in the United mm. States and immigrated to France. And, um, and so for me, I grew, I grew up in a very white, uh, racist household, um, n- somehow understanding because we had lived part of the time in Louisiana, that racism was constructed because I saw a difference and uh, put onto black bodies that was then mm. arbitrarily put onto North African bodies in the mm. south of France. And um, that was 12 when I understood that this was a, a, you know, it was kind of like one of the first lies that I believed adults had told me, that they had somehow told me, uh, not told me I was white. Like that was, yeah. that was, I was like, what is the, you know, this is, this is insane. And the construction of it just kind of invaded everything. I was a swimmer, a very white sport. Um, and there are a bunch of horrible reasons why that sport remains um, predominantly white. Um, so that have a lot to do with access, economics, you know, uh, yes. and the products that are put in the pool, except for in Australia, which is awesome. You know, like, so, um, you know, so I, I can definitely identify with that. And then I think about what it is to be a storyteller in the midst of all of that. And you work in memoir, mm-hmm. um, you know, and you have your own embodied history of what it means to have your, in many ways, um, have your history absented from any sort of awareness 
you know, learning that you have this lineage that exists in Australia that you were not necessarily told, finding a mm. sense of self. And then, you know, both you and I are really queer, you know, so it's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> super queer. <laughs> And so it's kind of like, how do we hold these, um, you know, how do we hold these, these stories um, and continue to tell them? Um, and in your case, it is, it is part of your, it's partially your story. I would love to show a trailer. Sure. It, okay. All right. <laughs> I'm going to share the screen um, for us. Um, and uh, I'm going to, okay, let's see if this. Oh, that's where it's I am. It's having to carry a secret. <laughs> it's even scarier putting yourself out there and showing people who you really are. <laughs> Smile. Is this okay? More than fine. I'm trying to put my body out on the market. Mommy's a reborn virgin anyway. Been so long, Mommy's sealed back up. Hey, Danny. Uh, Danny's. Uh... Husband. Ex husband. Separated. Not officially divorced yet. Is there a name for that? Do you have the hearts to We're so long ago. Thanks for saving my ass, Ben. Happy to save you. Oh my god. I've always wanted a gay best. There's only one thing you can do. So, Mom, mm -hmm. Dad, I have something to tell you. I, my baby boy, lad, then of AIDS! Melissa! Oh my god, you had a stiffy. That's hilarious. You can try running away, but your problems will always catch up with you. You're growing up now. Come to get thick skin and suck it off. We should be brave. It's more important than telling our truth. Wouldn't you rather take a risk and crash out than be safe and run her up? All you need are good people in your corner, like friends, loved ones. And if you're really lucky, family. Can I just say, we're totally winning at life right now. You have a date, I have a date. Like mother, like son. Yeah, we wrote a deranged little sitcom about coming out. I mean, this, I mean, the family law is often spoken about as, you know, the first Asian Australian family on TV. And that's true. But I'm, you know, equally proud that we wrote the first Hi, uh, show on Australian TV that showed a teenager Hold on. coming out as queer. Oh. Hold on. It's still playing. <laughs> it won't <laughs> stop. What's happening? Cursed. Okay. Cursed. Oh my oh, god, it's just oh my god. Not stop. <laughs> You're just gonna get a behind the scenes look at the entire show now. <laughs> I don't know how to make it stop. Oh here we go. Your Zoom oh is now cursed <laughs> with my family. <laughs> okay, here we go. <sighs> get it away. Get it away. <laughs> But you were saying something that is so perfect because it, yes, of course, in 2016, it was the first show to have, you know, an Asian American family as the lead, but it was also this beautiful. Yeah. This well, season three was like the first Australian TV show to look at a queer coming out story. And of course, you know, people have come out as queer on TV shows before in Australia, but there hasn't been the main plot line. Um, and we've seen people come out who are young, but usually in their 20s, like Please Like Me by Josh Thomas. But to have a teenager, that was, that was almost a bit of a provocation. And this did come at a time in Australia where a lot of the conversation was um, about, and a lot of the moral panic, was about queer kids, um, especially trans kids, but also about gay kids, um, because there had just been the same-sex marriage postal survey in Australia, which uh, was seeking to figure out whether we were allowed to marry each other. Um, but in all of that, the conservative Christian lobby was also throwing queer kids under the bus and using them as a scare tactic for the broader families. They're just like, do you want to, kids to be taught about queer stuff in schools? And as I was writing like a major journalism piece about that, 
um, it was the same year that we were developing that last season of the show. So when they talk about the gay agenda, I was very clear. Like I totally had, <laughs> I totally had an agenda. Gay writing agenda. That, yes. You know what I mean? Uh, something that could be safely shown at schools that are safely shown on Ida Hobbit Day or Wear It Purple Day, you know, these initiatives that schools are trying to do, they are they are often ill-equipped to actually have something that students can engage with beyond brochures and, and websites and stuff like that, which are, are also important. But I wanted to give them a way of introducing these conversations that weren't intimidating, um, weren't too serious but also showed an example of a family wrestling with something that's pretty common you know um a kid coming out and what that could actually look like so um i was quite stoked that that show got picked on goggle box i don't know if goggle box is a thing in america but no, it isn't yeah no it sounds folks what it is yeah so it's kind of it sounds like the worst show on the planet it is <laughs> a show where you watch people watching television and them responding, which sounds awful, but if you watch it, it's a, it's a, it's a British it's format and good. we've got yeah. it in. Yeah. And it shows this cross section of your own country that you don't necessarily encounter, you know, all races, all cultural backgrounds, all classes, suburbs, regions, rural city. Right. And the way that they all responded to this show was, real like I was like just as moved as watching this little kid come out to see like Australians all coming on board this very queer ethnic coming out story it was it was very heartening it was very heartening yeah and you know it's it's like when I hear my friends do stuff like this I'm like you know you know, the, it's like the world doesn't deserve you. You know what I mean? Like such generosity and also like such effectiveness, but also such beauty. And I think that in these times, particularly here in the United States, we forget, you know, I think, or it's important for us to remember that we come from a lineage of storytellers and that yeah. we have the ability to, um, you know, that you, we have the ability to think of others and think of the children in a very unique, um, in a very unique way, because so yes. many of us, I, you know, I'm a little bit older than you, but my generation, we were raised by our gay elders because many of us were rejected from our homes. And so, um, so to have this story, um, have you write it with these kids in mind as a tool that can mm. be, you know, that can in many, you know, I, I want to use words like infiltrate, but that's not the right one. <laughs> I mean, even though you and I offline can talk about that, but it's like sure, sure, sure. gay agenda, but it's like, uh, you know, that it has the ability to live in a mainstream space where it can really be of use to people yeah. who otherwise would not have access to this very specialized information that is about, you know, being fabulous and gay and queer and weird and, you know, also just like human and complicated. And I love, I didn't know that that was, and I'm also just like, not surprised <laughs> that that was such a driving, that that was one of the things that you considered while this was happening. Cause that was yeah. a horrible time for kids. It was and, and terrible during the public. Yes. Like it was. It was really, really awful and quite traumatizing. And I think so much of the language around the debate at the time was, well, we're adults. We should be able to discuss this openly. And I'm like, well, <laughs> You know, that queer kid in regional Tasmania, for instance, like they're having to listen to this every time their parents turn on the news. They now feel unsafe because their parents are talking about it with their uncles and aunties or whatever, you know, and, and it brings up queer phobic language in the school space, in the home space. It makes people feel really corroded inside. And, you know, when I came into writing, um, season three of the family law while I was writing this major kind of investigative essay yep. about this moral panic over queer kids here. Um, you know, I kept two things in mind, which is one, I spoke to so many teenagers, especially 
who had been kicked out of home. Yeah. Um, home wasn't a safe space. School wasn't a safe space. I wanted to engage with the people who had been reported on as some abstract concept. You know, the conservative newspapers here, they didn't talk to a queer teen once in all of their stories about queer teens. Do you know what I mean? They didn't talk to trans youth once in all of their myriad horror stories about trans youth. They never interviewed them. And I'm like, well, yeah. first of all, that's really bad journalism at best. <laughs> and then second of all, it's just such a dangerous enterprise to go out of your way to drive an agenda of demonization. And then I guess the other thing that I thought of was me as a kid. You know, I was really lucky in that when I came out at 17, um, my mom and my siblings and later my dad were all very supportive or at least supportive within the parameters of how they sure. would express support, which is, which is what I depicted in the show, right? Like sometimes your parents support you and it just comes out wrong. <laughs> um, but because I held on to this secret for so long, you know, my, my only other safe space was, I guess, pop culture. Uh, I, I think pe people poo poo pop culture a lot, but you know, queer people, for a long time before queer pop culture actually became explicitly that queer. That was the only place we were. That was it. Completely. And yeah. all that sort of codified stuff that we no. read into pop culture, you know, that the, the kind of like frequencies that it was sending off, like even though the gay people mightn't kiss or even though the trans people might not say they're trans, we kind of read them, we kind of totally. saw them, we kind of like, totally. that, that's me, right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to do that for another generation, but actually make it explicit this time. <laughs> you know, like I was, I was gonna be quite blunt about it. Ah, and you yeah. were, and you made this, like such a generous, beautiful love letter that now this story gets to live out there in the world. Like I just. Oh, that's a beautiful way of putting it. I hadn't thought about it because that way, but you know, the first two seasons of my book are kind of a love letter to my, to my family yeah. but I think that third one is kind of like almost a love letter to that younger kid yeah. version of myself who was you know riddled with anxiety but also all those other young people out there I think we 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 as now older queers ourselves Casey, oh my you know? god like they're, 40, they're, I they're, can't believe it I'm like gray and shit you know it's oh dude like i i was reading about all the um gen z kids sledging like i'm a millennial and reading how they sledge millennials on tiktok is so savage you know but um but i think people of our generation <laughs> i didn't above, understand anything of that sentence that's how gen x i am i'm like what like, what is a Z and a TikTok? The syllables make sense, but the words and the sentences do not. <laughs> oh, 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 I'll explain it to you off. Oh, I'll, explain it to you off. <laughs> right. uh, I'll bring up the app and show you. But, but I bring that up. I mean, you've also demonstrated the gulf between our generations, right? But I bring that up because I think Gen Xs like you, millennials like me, there is this assumption that because the kids now they've had glee they've got social media they've got um queer hotlines and websites uh even safe spaces and um you know queer alliances at schools that that it must be okay for them or it must be significantly better and for some kids it is better but I found like when I was talking to so many of them, because I feel like the people I associate with are my generation and above, and then really young kids, because yeah. all of my friends are breeding, but I don't know teenagers. Yeah. And it was with talking with teenagers for my research, I realized, oh my gosh, it is still, it's still really grim. You know, everyone celebrates in Australia that over 60% of Australians voted yes for same-sex marriage in this country. Great. I heard that and I was like, I was still kind of horrified because there, there were like well over 30% of people who voluntarily, because Australia has mandatory voting, but this postal survey was voluntary, but they went out of their way to say no. Like they really dislike us. And some of those people were in my extended family, you know, and they're now raising children. Yeah. And it makes me worry, like as much as I address so much hope in Generation Z and younger,
Well, it's like actually, it's it's still going to be hard for them, a yep. lot of them too. Yeah. Um, Ben, I feel like this is a really good place. I feel like this is a good place to stop because um, what it makes me think of is that you know we you know, there's a lot happening here. And we had a massive march yesterday, black trans mm. lives. We've had yes. so many deaths. And um, the thing is, is that we've known about these deaths, like they are part of our uh, fabric. And um, mm. the percentage of queer and trans youth that is homeless in New York City has not changed for many years, even it, so I think it's so important for us to remember that even though legislatively things perhaps should and are different, um, that we know so much as um, we know so much about uh, we know so much about what it is to be gay and queer and trans. Um, but the other thing that gives me hope is that so do they right mm -hmm. like yeah. our young ones are um you know the 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 suicide and self-harm is very real we are definitely like an at-risk and fragile young youth group um but uh i think it's also important to remember that especially now with the internet like there is the ability to find your people in a way that um you know i guess i also th this is what i'm trying to say you gave this beautiful love letter for these institutions right but you also gave this beautiful love letter for all of these kids and i also think you know i'm seeing a lot of stuff out around in the world around um that isn't storytelling that's instructions rather about mm. how they should be like here are the resources and i'm like all of the 14 year old trans kids that i've met and 15 and 16 they are fierce as fuck like they know mm. where everything is you know but what they don't have are access to the stories they mm. don't have access to to the stories of, in many ways, right? Like you discovering where you come from. You have this place mm. within this larger history of Australia yes. that is your country. Um, and I think that it's so important for us, you know, we might not be able to see, um, we might not be here for the ultimate change that I think mm. you and I both want, but I think it's important for you to keep telling those stories because we need the storytellers i'm getting mm. quite emotional oh thank you casey yeah. i mean you're a storyteller but also what you've been doing is sharing other people's and for that you know we're so extremely grateful it makes me think as you're saying that that you know when i think of my ethnicity and my place in australia that's kind of almost a family story you know what i mean like we find our yeah. roots Yep. But I think as queer people, we also need to do that too. Like we, we, so many of us grow up feeling so alone for so long, but we as queers also need to find our roots too. Like we do belong to a family, LGBTIQA+. Like this is, this is a whole bunch of letters of experiences that are not the same. You know, just like in a family, we're not the same, but we are a collective and we do have, a shared sense of story, history, and place. And until you find it, um, it can be, it can feel very disempowering, but when you actually find those stories, you find your history, that sense that I got in finding my family history, um, which we've done in documentaries and other things, that's something that queer people can do for themselves too. Yeah. Oh, Ben, I feel so lucky for your time. I'm oh, so I feel so grateful to you. Yours. <laughs> Casey, I want you to be in Australia, <laughs> but at the same time, it's good that you're there and doing the work. Um, okay, so I'm going to hit stop and then you and I will get to properly say goodbye. Um, but publicly here, thank you again, Ben. Uh, thank for you, Casey. Time.